Hello, everybody. Great opportunity to be together. Um, I want to commend the, the guys for organizing this amazing uh, equip. And even though Global Equip, you know, hasn't taken place, no reason why we can't use all the technology and uh, all the media stuff to get God's word out. Remember, our equip times are about preparing us for the call on our lives. And the very unique circumstances that we're going through right now with the lockdown and, you know, all the trouble, the fear, uh, you know, guys stuck at home and that uh, has provided us with an important situation to speak into. And so what I'm going to dive right in. What I want to talk about is leaders are initiators. There is a need for us to realize that without initiation, we're going to go nowhere. We cannot allow the current season of lockdown to lull us into complacency or procrastination. We, we, there is a fear that we've become very relaxed, you know, in our armchairs, you know, lying in our beds, watching, uh, you know, a, a kind of broadcast of some message or preach. Um, and I want to encourage us that human nature's default switch is one of comfort and kind of doing everything at our ease. But it is going to take some kind of initiation, someone with courage, some of us with a sense of faith and, uh, and vision in God to break this lull, to break the season of activity, inactivity, and inspire people to action. And, you know, much of um, history is uh, about those who challenge the status quo. Um, you know, you have the story in the of the unwise farmer and the great harvest. You know, his reason, uh, reckoning now that he's been blessed is let's build bigger barns. Uh, and, you know, then I'll rest, I'll chill, I'll kind of just enjoy my life. No, while there are still nations, while there are still people groups, while there are still cities and villages to be reached with the gospel, we need to see initiation take place. We win the war when we not only keep the ground that we've taken, but we've got to take new ground. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and we know the Corinthians uh, were spoken to with some very harsh words. Paul admonished them. Paul said, your meetings do more harm than good. But he, he didn't kind of say, well, you know, that's it. Just stop there now and work on that. No, he encourages them later. And he says, I'm looking at you at the land and the regions beyond you. In other words, we, we don't try and perfect what we have. The way we're going to perfect what we have and the way we're going to grow and mature is to keep taking new ground. If, if we ignore the challenge at hand, if we think we've made it as believers, we've made it as churches, we've made it as leadership teams, uh, and we just rest on our laurels and past victories, it's not going to work. The, wise, uh, uh, the, the farmer, who uh, God, when he looks at the vine, uh, it says he prunes two kinds of branches. He prunes the dead branches, and of course, if there are dead branches in our lives, the, the fear, the unbelief, um, the complacency, he cuts those off. And the second thing he does is he prunes those branches that have borne fruit in previous seasons. You need to cut them back because there's a new season coming and we're sensing it right now as we're coming out of COVID. We're not just sensing, you know, we'll come out of COVID and then kind of go back to what we are doing. No, there's a new season of challenge and opportunity. Nations are waiting. And so it's important we allow God to do the pruning so that we can fulfill the call that is on our lives to produce much fruit. So lockdown has been a reset where we've uh, come back to the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we've responded and we've realized that we, we can't rely on meetings. We can't rely on, on, on exterior factors to keep our faith going. It's an intimate relationship with Christ devoted to the word, devoted to prayer, devoted to fellowship, devoted to breaking bread. And so I want to encourage us around this. This the uh, testimony and the story of two old ladies, uh, octanagerians uh, in their 80s. One could hardly walk and the other could hardly see. They looked around in their little church, and they were trusting for an appointment of a new preacher. But they looked around, and they said, there aren't young people. 
And the two of them, on a weekly basis, I think it was a Tuesday night, would spend many hours, not just a half an hour, in prayer. And they would pray, Lord, bring revival. <laughs> These two old ladies initiated something. And guess what happened? The Hebrides revival broke out. So powerful was the presence of God is that people in the fields, as they were going about their normal farming duty, were getting born again, radically converted. And they were looking for people. They even went to the police station and said, help us because we need to be put in contact with Christians so that we can know how to be saved. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is another generation come, and this usually happens with moves of God, as they neither knew God or knew what God had done. They had no conviction about needing to continue to pioneer, and so it ends there. And you see, lockdown has been a, another kind of nail in that coffin that would kind of limit us and cause us to be complacent. Prior to lockdown, the, the cry was for commissioning and going out and planting and, and, you know, let's take more ground. This country needs to be impacted with the gospel. Churches still need to be planted in so many places. And lockdown has kind of caused us to become more lethargic. And so my encouragement to us, it's time to initiate. So I'm going to use Jonathan's example uh, as a lesson for us, uh, we find it in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. It's a time when Saul is king, Jonathan is Saul's son. Um, and, you know, prior to that, Saul had been rebuked by Samuel. Um, you know, Saul was going to be this great leader that would liberate Israel from the Philistines. Uh, and, you know, he was a head and shoulders kind of guy. He was taller than everybody. He was handsome. He was a strong man. He had good leadership skills, but he had an inability to obey. He had an inability to stay in his lane and do what God had called him to do. And on one occasion, when Samuel said, wait for me, I'll sacrifice. We can trust God and you can go and beat up the Philistines. He kind of felt that fear was kind of creeping into his people and he initiated, but wrongly so. And he did the sacrifice himself and Samuel rebukes him. And we know there's a slide downhill. He doesn't repent, doesn't sort it out, and eventually the kingship goes to David. But the chapter right after when Samuel rebuked him is, it talks about um, the Philistines have taken away all the weapons. The Israelites even had to go to the Philistines to get their farming equipment sharpened uh, because they were afraid that the Israelites you know, would rebel. There were two swords. One, Saul had one and Samuel had one. And so <clears throat> there's this period of inactivity like we were in and are in, in 1 Samuel 14. And one day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let's go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. He said in a few verses later, in verse 6, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. This is what the armor bearer says. Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Isn't that awesome? It talks about Saul being under the, uh, uh, he was sitting under a tree, a pomegranate tree. He, Saul sitting under the pomegranate tree with 600 of his soldiers. And uh, Jonathan has got a few hundred with him. And Jonathan decides, we need to take action. You see, God had said to them that they need to uh, root the Philistines. They need to overcome them. So the command was there. He wasn't going to be acting in disobedience. And so Jonathan, without his father knowing about it, does that. And he says to his armor bearer, you know what? What we're going to do is we're going to go up this pass because at each of the, of the passes, the Philistines were guarding against Israelite invasion. So he chooses one. And he says, what we're going to do to, this, uh, uh, to the armor bearer, we're going to go to the top of the pass. And if they welcome us and they call us to them, we're going to go there and beat them up. Basically, Jonathan was willing to fight them wherever. One sword, two men, and uh, a garrison of Philistines. And so when he shouts out to the Philistines, they shout back to him, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. It's amazing. That can sometimes be where our complacency puts us, our fear. 
you know, our kind of, we don't want to challenge the status quo. It looks impossible. You know, how can anybody go and plant a church uh, in, a, uh, in a Muslim nation? Or how can anybody plant a church in a Hindu nation? Or how can anybody plant a church in, you know, a postmodern, post-Christian nation, uh, an atheistic outlook on life, or in those bad conditions? It's like holes, that we go and hide in holes of excuse, holes of complaint. And so these Philistines are arrogant. And then the Philistines say to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come to us and we will show you a thing. Sneering. Of course, this was like a red flag to a bull. This is what Jonathan wanted to hear. Come up after me, he says to the armor bearer, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Obviously, he discerned. There's an arrogance here. There's a, 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 a terrible attitude. You know, these guys just presume uh, that, you know, we are like dogs. We only have one sword. Uh, they're going to take us out. And it's amazing. It says, they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, killed them after him. There were 20 that they killed. Killed about 20 men. And there was panic in the camp, in the field, and among the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked and it became a very great panic. And so one act of bravery, one bit of initiation, it is the will of God. It's, this is what God has said to us. As a nation, I'm going to give you the Philistines. The Philistines now have got every pass protected. The Israelites have got no way up. Their numbers are few. Their leader's disillusioned. He's sitting under a pomegranate bush. He's sulking. He's been rebuked by Samuel. Uh, but the son says, no, I'm going to initiate, and I'm going to go and take on these Philistines. And he beats them up, and the news of that spreads to the Philistine camp. God causes an earthquake to take place. Amazing. Verse 16, the multitude was dispersing here and there. Verse 19, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. Verse 20, then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. Every Philistine's sword was against his fellow, and there was great confusion. Uh, verse 22, all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard the Philistines were fleeing, and they followed too, hard after them in battle. Verse 23, wonderful way for this to end. It says, the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond beth Avon. Isn't that awesome? One act of bravery, one bit of initiation, and amazing results. Many were drawn in, and there was a great victory for the Israelites today. So I do feel that in many circumstances, uh, you know, we are in this place of impasse. We, we kind of perhaps have become lazy in our faith. Uh, we've become afraid in wanting to risk. These are all real. Uh, you know, how do we get into this foreign country and plant? And you know, some of us as well, well, that's human nature. Uh, no, but God's challenging you to initiate, you know, read the Bible this year, um, you know, start to reach out to people in love. Ah, but, you know, I'm scared of people. I'm not an A-type personality. And as we know, God uses loud mouths, confident people more than others. No, rubbish. God is looking to each of us to break the status quo and to become initiators. Interesting, in Revelation chapter 3, the seventh church that he's written to is a church that has become lukewarm. And lukewarmness is, is something that God detests. He, he spews it out of his mouth. It's something that doesn't belong to Christianity. You cannot associate lukewarmness with Christianity. I remember being taught Sunday school, and uh, kind of the, the lecturer that taught me said, please don't bore children with Christianity. Because there's absolutely nothing boring about this gospel message. There's nothing lukewarm and mild and mediocre and, and, you know, like pathetic about Christianity. Christ has come to set the captives free. Christ died on the cross. He never argued himself into salvation. He died on the cross. He paid with his life. He rose from the dead. This is dramatic. And when we see the record of the first church in the book of Acts, as the Holy Spirit moves through the believers, it's adventure. And I know there were times where they sat, but there was always initiating. We've got to take this gospel beyond. We've got to go further. We need to initiate. And it's going to take some in the camp 
to initiate. I believe God looks at leaders who should be leading with initiating, but every one of us should be busy with that. And so God, uh, Jesus rebukes that church. You think everything's together. See, a lot of times in our Christianity, in our personal lives and in churches, when we've got everything, we've got the building, we've got the people, we've got the budget, uh, you know, or we've got the house, we've got the wife, we've got the kids, we've got the car, everything's cool. No, it's not. As long as there are unsaved people on this planet, we have a brief from God, like Joshua, um, like uh, Jonathan did, those Philistines need to be taken out, and we need to be called to action. We need to understand this, and we need to make a difference. You see, winning the ones and the twos, our neighbors and our family and our friends, all the way to planting churches, all of those aspects of initiation are important. So scripture contrasts Jonathan's action and Saul's inactivity. Sure, Saul initiated, but wrongly so. And there can be initiating that tries to draw attention to me. It's something God hasn't called me to. Uh, it's disobedience. It's more rebellion than initiating. But Jonathan, Bible never says much about him, but he was a honest, he was an integrous man, he was a loyal friend. And yeah, Jonathan just picks a fight. And it's up to us. I tell you, there are battles waiting for us so that we can overcome we can overcome. If an enemy is to defeat it, someone has to take the initiative. It's interesting. The Bible says Saul was sitting under the pomegranate tree. They say that it was pomegranate trees is the wrong term. It should be a pomegranate bush. And under a pomegranate bush, you can't seat many people, one person. So in his loneliness, he was sitting there sulking, he was probably going over Samuel's rebuke and thinking, you know, I'm the king and I'm getting told off by this prophet. You know, there's always an excuse for inactivity. And Saul had a whole lot of them. <clears throat> Contrasted is Jonathan who takes the initiative. Nobody even noticed Jonathan's departure, it says in the scripture. For me, it shows the state of paralysis and disinterest that they were in. Nobody noticed. You see, when God's purposes are clear, Obedience means action. You know, James says, I know you have faith, but your faith needs to be accompanied by action. You know, one John talks about, um, <clears throat> you know, if somebody comes to you with food, we can't just pray, Lord, fill his stomach. No, give him a meal. Go and buy him some food. And, and we can't just pray over this world only. Sure, start by praying, but we need to say, what is my part in it? You see, I want to break this impasse. I want to kind of, Take up the call of, that, that God is issuing right now, that there's way more for us uh, to get busy with. There's regions beyond that need to be impacted with the gospel. And the time is short. And God has given us this command. Make disciples of all nations. Take this gospel to these, the nations before the second coming of Christ. You see, the, the task is abundantly clear. It was abundantly clear for Jonathan. And it's important that our faith has this action to it. You know, Jonathan was going to fight them at the bottom of the pass, the top of the pass. But when he realized their arrogance and God was leading him that way, it was easy. And I feel once we initiate, once the car's moving, it's easier to steer. But the longer we sit and do nothing, nothing's going to happen. We need to get up and start to take action. Uh, I just remember near the end of last year, a team of us were going somewhere. I was at the airport. We were on mission. We were going to preach the gospel. And as we were walking through the airport, God pointed out a family to me. And I thought, yeah, you know, this is it's going to kind of delay us a little bit. But I stopped and I just talk, started to talk to them about the love of Christ. The guy was a brute. Actually, I was scared of approaching him because this guy was ripped, you know, very ripped. He was having an argument with his wife and his boy, his son. But I stopped and I said, you know, sir, can I have a word with you? Um, I, I just felt to stop you and remind you that God loves you. The guy's a backslidden Christian, tears and kind of pray over them and, you know, I don't know where they were going. I didn't even ask that. But there was a moment there where the grace of God was ex uh, had been exposed to them and they were receiving in their situation, in their tears and whatever what was going on over there, the love of God became very real to them. And all of us are on mission. All of us look, need to open our eyes to what God's showing us. And so Jonathan was confident in God. 
I know another story like that out of the Bible. True. David. David arrives at the battlefield and Goliath is there. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? David says. And we know that uh, everybody who had been paralyzed by fear. It took David to, with his confidence in God, to initiate and with, you know, underwhelming weaponry, overcome. Because he realized that God's, plus David, according to God's will, would overcome. Same, God plus Jonathan put the Philistines, uh, they were running. They were starting to stab each other. There was chaos. An earthquake happened. Uh, it was magnificent. Remember the other time, Paul and Silas, they were in jail. They'd been preaching the gospel, for goodness sake. They'd already initiated. I wonder what that conversation was in jail. So they've been whipped. They're in jail. They're bleeding. They're hurting. The middle jail is low. Uh, it's, it's kind of almost pitch black dark. Uh, I'd, I'd imagine cockroaches and all kinds of things running all over them, back pulsating with pain. Uh, I can imagine Silas thinking, cheap, is this is the will of God. And then Paul says, hey, Silas, I've got a plan. Ah, Paul knows how to pick locks. Paul's going to get us out of here. No, Paul says, let's start singing songs of praise. Let's initiate. Let's do something. And through that, earthquake happens. They set free. Uh, the Philippian jailer is born again. His family, they baptize. A church is planted. Wow. Through initiating. They had every right in my mind, Silas had, to just whimper and complain. But did he do that? No. If you listen to what Paul was saying probably, and then the two of them start to worship God. Initiate. Initiate. You're sitting there in your glum and your gloom. COVID, fear of COVID. Maybe you've even lost your job or you've got less income or you don't know how you're gonna get through it. Paul shows us, start to praise God. I tell you, right now, God's looking for initiators. A great God with somebody who's available will produce dramatic results. And so we see the Philistines flee. I love the way it ends. The Lord saved Israel that day. For me, there were many heroes in this story. The armor bearer, Jonathan, many others who rose to fight the battle. Those who had kind of crossed over to the Philistines came back and helped fight that fight. But you know what? We will continue to have victory when we give God the victory. And, and you know, on purpose, the spirit who inspired the scriptures gives all glory to God. All glory to God. Moses on the mountain when they were fighting the Amalekites ends that way. The banner over them, the victory over them is God. And that is God will give us new opportunities if we keep giving the glory. See, this wasn't Jonathan's day. This was God's day. Jonathan was available. I think of the four lepers when Samaria was sieged uh, by the Syrian army. And there was no food inside. And they said, well, let's go out the gate because we're going to die here or we're going to die there. They at least initiated. They got going. And when they walked outside, the Syrians had fled. There was food. There, were, there was spoils to collect. And they went and shared it with everyone. Awesome. You know, I think the, of the 10-2 principle. 12 spies go into the land. And 10 come back with negative reports. They, all they saw was giants. And the two come back, all they saw was the promise of God. And that teaches me the 10-2 principle is I'm 10 times more inclined to see the negatives, to see the difficulties, to see the obstacles, to see the giants than I am to see the promise of God. So I have got to focus on this. I've got to be intentional as an initiator. And of course, we know later on, one of those two, Caleb, at 85, and I'm speaking to all those who are a little older, at 85, no retiring, give me the hill country. 45 years after that incident, he's still ready. Age hasn't eroded his passion. He's ready to take on what God is giving them as an opportunity. And so I want to encourage you right now. Pioneer, read your Bible. Pioneer, reach out to others in love. Pioneer and initiate. Uh, this world is full of those that need to be reached with the gospel. Like William Wilberforce, changes the way trade is done. Slave, no longer slavery, industrial revolution takes place. Uh, plant a church, pioneer a nation. Uh, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Jesus has called us to great things in him. And every single one of us has a part to play. 
So I want to encourage us with this. Allow God to challenge your heart and don't be complacent and become one who initiates. Bless you guys.